The biosphere that we live in is sustained, regulated by the plants, and it's plant activity that gives us the air that we breathe, the food that we eat, most of the medicines that we take to stay healthy. And yet, about one third of plant life is at risk of going extinct. I think biodiversity is very important. And when we have more and more plants entering the rare and endangered list, it's a sign that the ecosystem is really damaged. Rare plants tell us many stories about the specialness of the habitat that they are living in. Plants of Concern was developed because of the need to protect these rare plants and make sure they didn't blink out or disappear entirely. Through Plants of Concern, we have an opportunity to go and monitor plants in their natural environment. We collect a lot of data about how healthy the populations are, whether they're reproducing, whether they are under threat. And all this information is passed on to the land managers. In the forest preserves of Cook County, we have over 550 subpopulations of rare plants. And there's no way that our staff would be able to annually monitor these plant populations. So having the assistance of Plants of Concern and those volunteers, that helps us on a local scale to understand whether our rare plants are increasing or decreasing within our holdings. So there's already a number of threats that these systems face, fragmentation, invasive species, urbanization, and now we have climate change. And what climate change really does is just amplify a lot of those threats that are already there. These natural systems can start to come apart. That can play out in terms of pollination, bird migration, all sorts of things. So one of the real benefits of Plants of Concern is the consistency of the data collection. Having the standardized protocol helps us see trends. If some of our rarest, most conservative species are happy, then we know that's a good sign that we're doing the right things. When you walk out of a forest preserve that has not been cleared of buckthorn, that's just a tangle of weeds, and then you walk into a natural area that has been well managed, it's a totally different place. It feels very peaceful. There are sounds. You can hear the wind in the trees. You can hear insects buzz and birds call. It's truly a magical kind of thing when you're really in a place that's healthy and whole. Plants of Concern builds a base of people who are passionate about rare plants and who now have an intimate knowledge of how this species is doing and have a connection to one of our sites. So not only are we getting amazing data, but we're also building this really amazing cadre of advocates and stewards for the land. I think it's a great privilege to take care of the ecosystem, to care for it, because it nurtures us and all the animals around us. So I think it's, it's an important thing that we have to do for them. So I apologize if that was hard to hear. I don't think I hit the optimization I was supposed to, but in any event, you can watch that video on the website uh, for the Plants of Concern program. So I'd like to thank um, <clears throat> Chris and the Southern Chapter Board of the Illinois Native Plant Society for inviting me to talk about the Plants of Concern program, a community science rare plant monitoring program. So of course, my name is Chris Benda, and I was hired in January to be the coordinator for the Plants of Concern program in Southern Illinois. And this is a partnership between the Chicago Botanic Garden and Southern Illinois University. <clears throat> and I'm working under the supervision of Dr. David Gibson and his lab here in the formerly Department of Plant Biology School of Biological Sciences. And as Chris, oh, I also continue to teach the flora of Southern Illinois. It's actually my 10th year teaching that class and it's online this summer. And as Chris mentioned, I'm former president of the state group, governing board, as well as the Southern chapter. And I still edit the Harbinger, the state uh, newsletter. And I am a life member of Illinois Native Plant Society at the Iliamna level, which is a little higher um, life membership option that we implemented during my term as president. So Illinois is called the Prairie State. 
it's uh, kind of unfortunate now that there's very little prairie really remaining in Illinois. The estimate of the 22 million acres originally in the prairie, uh, just 2,200 acres remain as a high quality natural condition. And if you add up all of Illinois and all the pristine or nearly pristine natural communities, uh, just 0.07% is considered to be in a pristine or nearly pristine condition. And that's a 1979 statistic. So very, very little, which is why it's important to have programs like Plants of Concern to monitor rare plants and natural communities. I'd like to uh, have this mention this land acknowledgement that uh, for Southern Illinois, this is the ancestral homeland of the Illiniwit Confederation. And that's a loose confederation of many different tribes. Also in Southern Illinois, we have the Shawnee National Forest and Colonel L.O. Trigg, was instrumental in getting the development of the Shawnee National Forest uh, created. And he led these annual Ozark tours, which took people out to see the natural beauty of Southern Illinois. And that you know, led to the public support and uh, critical mass that was needed for the establishment of the forest in 1939. So that was just during the CCC era, of course, and we have um, some CCC um, you know, staircases and lodges and various structures that they helped build. Um, the Shawnee National Forest is one of the smallest national forests. It's the 19th smallest, according to my research, out of the 154 national forests. It's 289,000 acres, approximately. And of course, the USDA Forest Service mission, um, really, it's a, it's a multi-use mission. And luckily, um, in some respects, um, we've kind of cut all the trees I think we're going to cut in, in this area or, or um, well, there's always a lot of different things going on. But what I want to say is that there, the natural areas have been identified and are kind of set aside. And that's really where a lot of these rare plants occur in the Shawnee National Forest. But there are other public lands in southern Illinois. And that's another reason why um, it was great to have the program expanded to this area. You can see on the map that we have the National Forest. There are also federal wildlife refuges, Cypress uh, Creek and Crab Orchard. And we have a, a number of state uh, owned properties. And then in the red, you can see the, the natural areas that are overlaying all those different lands. And it would be uh, wise to recognize some of the conservation leaders that kind of led us to where we are today. Of course, the foremost uh, person to thank for this is George Fell. You can read about his efforts in his life in the book Force of Nature, Biography. And he, of course, uh, was instrumental in starting the, Na the Nature Conservancy and then later the Natural Land Institute and in creating the Illinois Nature Preserves Commission. And is really just a visionary in natural area preservation that he was from the Rockford area. And I also want to mention, of course, Stephen Packard then really took that to another level by engaging the public to help with volunteer restoration. And so it was really important to connect people with nature and get them outside for their health, as well as the health of the ecosystem. And there are some other conservation leaders, I think it makes sense to briefly acknowledge. Dr. Molenbrock, of course, out of Southern Illinois University. He's the plan authority for the state with the book, The Vascular Flora of Illinois and the Companion uh, Illustrated series. Dr. Gerald Wilhelm wrote The Floor of Chicago Region, and he was a graduate student of Dr. Mullenbrock's. Uh, John Schwegman was the first employee for the Illinois Nature Preserves Commission and was our state botanist for a lot, most of his career. And he was also a graduate student of Dr. Mullenbrock's. Um, and then before those men, there were some women that made huge contributions to science and really in efforts to communicate science to the public. Uh, May Watts was a naturalist at the Morton Arboretum, and she wrote the book Reading the Landscape, which really says a lot about natural areas and understanding high quality natural communities. As well as Norma Pfeiffer, she discovered the Thysmia Americana, which is an amazing story. If you're not familiar with the story of Thysmia in Chicagoland, I encourage you to do some Google searching and read about that. It's really fascinating. And of course, Mary Agnes Chase as well was instrumental in really teaching grasses to the masses. And she has the author of the first book of grasses. Now, as um, mentioned in the video, a third of all plants may be at risk of extinction from this 2015 publication. And so that's an alarming statistic. And 
you know, of course, we want to make sure we're doing what we can to conserve and protect um, the vegetation and plants so that they don't go extinct. I mentioned some of the threats to native plants. You think of, you know, all of the United States or North America was a native plant habitat before large scale, you know, European colonization. Um, and now we've changed the landscape drastically. And so this has affected the native plant population. So loss of habitat would be one of the threats. And you can see here the skyline of Chicago and the associated development in suburbia beyond. And so looking at this photo, you can tell that there's not a lot of places for plants to live here. It's mostly pavement and buildings, uh, probably a few trees mixed in, but you know, not, not a lot of habitat available in that area for plants. We also have fragmentation concerns. Um, so not only um, are the, is the habitat less you know, than, than previously, but also what we have remaining is very fragmented into little pieces. There's not much contiguous land mass um, for plants to expand or to migrate and move around and, and, uh, and for you know, genetics to be exchanged. So if you look at Jackson County, it's not actually you know, too terrible. We have quite a bit of green there, the intact forest, because we have the Shawnee National Forest uh, in this county. But if you look at Champaign County, the story is a little bit different. You can see the land is divided into all these little squares. Those are sections and quarter sections. And, and the land, you know, it's mostly been converted to agriculture, of course, with the cities of Champaign and Urbana there in the middle. And if we go up to Cook County, if you were just seeing that aerial photo of, you know, it's largely urbanized. And so very little contiguous habitat for plants there. You can see kind of right in the middle of the picture, there is the Palis Hills area that's fairly large, but there's still roads that run through there and some houses and things. So those are some of the threats. Then we have uh, invasive species. So bush honeysuckle is one in this area that is particularly dominant. It, it grows in, in the forests mostly, you know, wherever birds can perch and defecate. They eat the berries and they spread them around. And uh, it's really a, an invasive that's really filled in our forests. And then another one that uh, the bush honeysuckle can be controlled fairly easily, cutting an herbicide, but Japanese stillgrass is much harder to control because it's an annual, produces a lot of seed. I've actually had some success um, with some small infestations near my home by either weed wagging it in August or even hand pulling. Um, but obviously that's not that sustainable on a large scale. But you can see here the Japanese stillgrass infestations and that's really gonna displace our native vegetation. So those are just two of many invasive threats that we have on the ecosystem here in Southern Illinois. And of course, all this is compounded by climate change. As, um, Becky also mentioned in the video, uh, basically it's predicted that Illinois will, will be more Southern in its climate as time goes on. And actually for Southern Illinois, that might be somewhat beneficial because a lot of plants are at the Northern edge of the range in Southern Illinois. So as the climate warms, it actually might shift um, Southern species farther North. So that, that might work out well for rare plants in Southern Illinois, but in Northern Illinois, there are plants at the Southern edge of their range. And with the climate change effects, those plants will, will probably be more favorable farther north and they may actually disappear from Illinois. So climate change is definitely a continual issue, big issue. So what is the plants of concern? So we have kind of three factors here that fit into this definition or this explanation. We have people, so community scientists who are engaging the public to collect data and advocate for natural native plants. Um, of course, the plants are part of the component. We're monitoring rare plants and their habitat health, and then creating partnerships. So, you know, it's one thing to get people involved and collect the data, but what do you do with it? Well, we're sharing it with land agencies, we're sharing it with, uh, with the state, with the Illinois Endangered Species Protection Board, and that helps us, you know, conserve uh, the rare flora. And all this data will lead to conservation solutions. So this may help identify uh, natural areas and lead to their protection 
and even management. And I'll talk more about some management uh, a little bit later. But again, the goal is to conserve these rare species. And while we're doing that, to educate and engage the public, because the most important aspect of conservation, of course, is public support. So we are interested in rare and listed species. So listed means that it's on the state threatened and endangered list or on the federal threatened and endangered list. But there are also species that are rare that are not included in those two lists. So there's kind of three categories. We see Asclepias medii as Meads milkweed. That is a federally threatened species. So listed at the federal level. Then the next example is Micranthes virginiensis, the early saxifrage, that is an Illinois endangered plant. If you go outside of Illinois, particularly to the east, um, early saxifrage is fairly common. So it's not federally listed, it's just rare in Illinois. And then Durka palustris is leatherwood, and that is considered regionally rare. Um, in fact, a publication by Paul Markham and others um, looked at populations of leatherwood throughout Illinois. And I think they found 20 extant populations, although um, I was alerted to a couple new populations this year, so we may be up to 22. But leatherwood is a species that is not currently tracked at the state level, but the Shawnee National Forest does have it as a regional forested, uh, forester sensitive species. And so it is tracked if it occurs on the Shawnee National Forest land. And if you're not familiar with leatherwood, it's really aptly named. Um, it's very pliable. And in fact, there was a landowner that, um, oh, I should mention a couple new locations were found this year thanks to Jenny Lesko. And Jenny is a state uh, IDNR forester. And it's really awesome to have a state forester out looking at public uh, private lands and knowing the, the vegetation and the herbs and such and being able to identify some of the rare ones. So she tipped me off to a couple new populations of leatherwood. And one of the landowners knew it was different and didn't know what it was because he said that you could bend the, the twigs so much. In fact, I, I joke and say that you could tie your shoes uh, with a twig of leatherwood. It's really that pliable and hence the name. So those are the kinds of examples of species we're tracking uh, for the program. And this is providing data for conservation. Mainly it's feeding the natural heritage database. The, the natural heritage database is really the, the place where um, all things are known and it should be you know, a comprehensive database for, for what's known to occur in Illinois as far as rare species. Um, and this, is, you know, it's, it's useful to have this <clears throat> centralized source of information and it will inform land managers about how to better manage their habitats. And on that note, uh, I would like to share this case study. Um, so the program manager of Plants of Concern um, in Chicago land, Gretel, and she shared this uh, study uh, with me that I want to share with you about the dune willow. So they've been monitoring this dune willow, as the name implies, on the dunes of Lake Michigan. And you know, in Illinois, there's very little shoreline along Lake Michigan, and there's of that, there's very little shoreline that is intact and naturally vegetated. And Illinois Beach State Park is one of the places where a lot of this habitat occurs. And so this is where they've been monitoring the dune willow, a couple of volunteers for you know 20 years or so, more than 10 years at least. And um, some complications there that led to, led to action. So Salix certicola, it's the dune willow. It's a dioecious species. So they're separate male and female plants. And as you can imagine, if you're a rare species, um, the sex ratio plays an important role in reproduction. And so that's an important characteristic to keep in mind for this particular plant. So what they were noticing, you see here in this graph, year 2012, um, 4,045 individuals there on the beach represented by the black polygons. But then three years later, number of individuals, 122, and you can see there's a lot less beach habitat. And the blue polygons show where the extant individuals were at that time because the lake levels are rising and we're losing some beach habitat. And then by 2018, well, all the original 2012 populations were in the lake. 
and of course not surviving being underwater constantly. So, you know, lake levels should fluctuate to some degree, but they've been um, too high basically for, for a, many years in, in, on Lake Michigan. Also, the beach, even though it erodes, it also gets replenished because sand is moving around on the shoreline. But at Illinois Beach State Park, we have Winthrop Harbor at the very extreme northern edge of the border, actually pretty much borders Wisconsin. And that is basically like a big berm that juts out into the lake and basically blocks the sand from moving down uh, south along the shore and replenishing uh, Illinois Beach. And unfortunately, there's not much we can do with that hydrological alter alteration. Um, we're not going to be able to take out Winthrop Harbor. That's a, it's a big uh, harbor where you know there's lots of boats kept and people come in and out there, their yachts and things. Um, so it has profound effects on the beach at Il Illinois Beach State Park. So the lake is eroding. And you can see in the picture, the red stems there, those are dune willows and they're eroding away and not being able to have a foothold in the sand um, as the sand is, is moved around. Of course, we also have flooding of the swales. So along the beach, we have this four dune, uh, dune and swale topography. It's, it's undulating topography where the dunes are where it's high and dry and the swales are where it's, it's the lower ground and where it's you know, wet depressions. And they should seasonally flood. It's not unusual for them to have standing water in them, but they shouldn't be uh, flooded or for a long time have standing water. And as you can imagine, and then that's what these twigs are in the, the photo, these plants sticking out of the water, that's the dune willow. And it can survive some inundation, but not for long periods of time. And so the flooding is really causing an issue with the persistence of the dune willow at this site. So a picture that kind of shows the dynamics here, you can see this inlet, this river that makes its way to Lake Michigan, that's called the Dead River. And the Dead River actually, sometimes uh, when the lake levels are high and you get a lot of water, you know, it'll back up uh, behind it. And sometimes it, there's a sand plug that occurs at the beach with Lake Michigan. And so it actually will impound water behind it. And that's one of the phenomena that lead to um, the high water levels being retained in these swales. And that's why they call it the Dead River, because often it doesn't quite reach uh, Lake Michigan. So it's kind of cut off in that respect. So you can see the populations were close to the beach and they actually decided, well, we we're looking at not only were we losing individuals because of erosion and the flooding, but also there just didn't seem to be any recruitment. Even the plants that were not threatened and maybe a little farther inland, we're not reproducing. And because we're, you know, seeing drastic population uh, decreases, we took, you know, they basically decided to take a fairly drastic action to try and basically make more plants, put more plants out there. So the monitors, uh, Karen and David involved, um, monitoring these plants over time. And basically with uh, Kathy Thomas and crew at the Chicago Botanic Garden, they took cuttings you know, willow is a species that you can fairly easily transplant. You stick, you know, twigs in the ground and they'll turn into new plants. And so what they did was cut off some branches and the branches were cut from known male or female individuals. So that could be um, kept track of. And they were, you know, nurtured, propagated in, in the greenhouse until they you know, reached a large size and they could be transplanted into the wild. So here we have in March 2020, some of the newly planted dune willow uh, out there at Illinois Beach State Park. And there's, there's a number of sites um, where this plant occurs. Uh, and, and so far, the genetics haven't been you know, moved. Plants from Illinois Beach were planted at Illinois Beach and so forth. But if, if there's issues, you may want to look into moving plants from different sites so that's some genetic transfer um, and, and that might help with reproductive success. So the update, um, Gretel and crew were there in May, uh, this last May and, and counted the 38 of the 58 plants survived the first year. So two thirds, that's, that's pretty decent. It would be interesting to see how this project advances. So, the, you know, that that's uh, one way to 
put things back in the landscape there and it leads to you know different forms of management like i said this was a hydrology problem and it, it, you really unfortunately you can't do a lot about the hydrological alteration relating to the dune willow but there is management that can be done in other instances so you see the chainsaw um you know in chicago land they have a lot of buckthorn we don't have buckthorn in at least the non-native buckthorn in, in southern Illinois, but we have bush honeysuckle, we have common privet, we have autumn olive, we have multi-floor rose, and you know those are fairly easy. I guess I would say you know it's hard work, but you know you cut them and spray them, and and it's it's easy to get a hold on it. In that sense, it's just really labor intensive. Uh, we could also have prescribed wire, which helps manage the landscape and benefits rare and native plants. And then even sometimes we have you know hand pulling. We have volunteers out there removing the unwanted vegetation. So those are some basic examples of how we can manage the landscape to benefit a rare vegetation. So up to 2020, there were a number of um, different institutions that supported the Plants of Concern program, and they received an anonymous gift that year that allowed them to embark on this community science initiative. So the community science initiative, this, this an anonymous gift led to the plants of concern being expanded to Southern Illinois. Um, and again, that started mid January of this year. So we're just a few months underway. Um, it funded the production of the video that we watched at the beginning, as well as a mobile app, uh, online training and a website update. So the online training is very simple. It's plantsofconcern.org. And you can sign up to be a volunteer. You can complete the training online. You know, this was done in person um, for many years. And, and there's benefit, of course, to being in person, but uh, it's also limiting. And of course, with the pandemic concerns, it was really timely to have online training created so people could do it at home and, and get trained up for the field. So I encourage anyone listening who's uh, interested in being a volunteer to go to plantsofconcern.org and sign up for the training and watch the videos. And also this is partnered with a mobile app. I just downloaded the app today on my phone. Um, and this is what volunteers are going to use for data collection in the field. I use my phone already um, in the field a lot to uh, collect data. And now the app makes it really easy um, to prompt you on, on what information to collect and the GPS is built in. So it's really going to be a handy tool rather than printing off forms and then having to enter those in later and, and you know having some concerns with that. So the mobile app is really bringing us into the 21st century here with our data collection. And then the website was revamped and you might want to check out the plant search on the website, to get an idea of some of the plants that are tracked uh, with the Plants of Concern program. And then here we show have a, a diagram of the Plants of Concern reach. So in Northeast Illinois, the Plants of Concern program has been underway for about 20 years. And it even includes a little bit in Indiana there. And then Southern Illinois, it's basically the southernmost unglaciated portion of the state. Um, although I do have aspirations to uh, move up into Randolph and Monroe County, particularly Full Till Prairie, where there are a lot of rare species, it'd be an important place, I think, for the program to have a presence. So ideally, we fill in the gaps with Central Illinois and Northwest Illinois, um, you know, sometime in the future. But so far, at least, you know, we're, we're progressing to cover more counties and more areas in the state. Of course, Southern Illinois is a lot different than the rest of the state. Um, we have a lot of public land and a lot of places for plants to live, like I mentioned, a lot of diversity, a lot of plants that just barely make their way into Illinois from the south and are found you know, in the southernmost part of the state. So it really makes sense to have this region uh, included in the program. All right, so what do we do? How do we do this monitoring, the protocol and data? So the idea is that a volunteer will visit a rare plant population annually and you know, initially I, I go with the volunteer the first time and we get everything straightened out. And then the idea is they come back on their own or as a team or whatever to continually uh, monitor through time these populations. So they're gonna record, of course, the spatial extent where the plants occur. And the GPS is built in on the app that helps 
you know, put the location recorded. Uh, also, obviously, we want to count the number of plants there. We want to get an, an idea of the, comp, the population size. And then not only how many individuals are there, but how many are reproductive. So either in flower or fruit. So we get an idea, you know, that could relate to recruitment um, for a particular species. We list the dominant native plants, the associates that are occurring with the rare plants that are being monitored, as well as the invasive plant cover and other impacts, you know, deer browse, unauthorized trails, um, things of that nature. And then of course, evidence of management is helpful to collect as well. If there's been prescribed fire, you can see burn scars. If there's been invasive species removal, um, you know, that can be noted as well. So these are the things that are recorded in the field during a monitoring visit. So some of the, I'm gonna show now some of the uh, landscape, some of the natural community types and plants in Southern Illinois that either are being monitored or that I hope to monitor. Start with limestone glades. We've got a couple of really nice limestone glades on Saturday and it's really, really hot. That's a really terrible time to be out in a limestone glade, but these are wonderful community types. They have rock close to the surface, the limestone, um, it's broken into you know, lots of pieces, so they're sort of, sort of flaggy, it's the term we use, um, but very shallow soils. And this is where prairie plants live. These are natural forest openings uh, throughout the Lesser Shawnee Hills. So some plants rare there, we have the Meads milkweed, as mentioned earlier, grows in limestone glades. We have Matelia obliqua, which was formerly listed at the state level, and it, it was delisted because it's actually doing quite well. Um, but that is one may continue to monitor. And then blue sage is another rare plant in Illinois that uh, occurs on these limestone glades. And lastly, the Hexelectris spicata, the crested coral root orchid, which is very rare. And they don't always come up every year in the same place or the same number. So this is an excellent candidate for annual monitoring. So we can understand a little bit more about the population dynamics of this um, this parasitic or saprophytic orchid. Sandstone cliffs, another natural community that's really neat. We have a lot of exposed uh, rock in Southern Illinois. And some of these cliffs are often fairly moist. And so that'll harbor a lot of plants. And, you know, it's kind of hard to mess up a sandstone cliff unless um, there's rock climbing going on or perhaps some land use activities above the cliff could lead to erosion or um, influence of invasive species. But a lot of the sandstone cliffs are fairly intact. And the picture here shows Bishop's cap. That's Metella diphyla. And that's the little spikes of white flowers there on the cliffs. But we also have other species on sandstone cliffs like Hylotelphium telophioides, formerly Sedum telophioides. Saw some of that today. Uh, it's wild or pine. It's the common name that we have. Pupersia parophylla is the cliff club moss. That's uh, not an actual moss, but um, a lycophyte. It's a fern ally, reproduces with spores, kind of a neat looking plant there. Then uh, Vanden Boschia, Boschianum, it's formerly Trichomenes, and that's the filmy fern. And filmy fern grows back in the darkest, farthest, hardest to reach areas of sandstone overhang. You sometimes need a flashlight to get down uh, back into the crevice and look for filmy fern. And you think, how does something photosynthesize uh, back in the dark like that? But they like the, the cool, moist, shaded sandstone overhangs. And there are 16 or so locations uh, across Southern Illinois for filmy fern. And then we have the Femeranthus parviflorus, the beautiful small flowered fame flower or flower of an hour, because each individual flower only blooms for one day, about an hour or so. And in Southern Illinois, I found that this species really blooms late in the day. At one of the sites I visited, um, they started blooming about 6 p.m. So really, really late in the day for that plant. And then of course, the French's shooting star. This is uh, an iconic species of Southern Illinois, it only grows along the drip line of sandstone bluffs uh, and under sandstone overhangs, or even on some of the sandstone ledges. Um, throughout the Greater Shawnee Hills Natural Division. And I am reluctantly finally embraced the genus change name to Primula. I really favored Dodecathion. It's a, such a beautiful name, but um, 
as I say, people smarter than me decided that it's more closely related to the Primula genus. It's been reclassified. And so Primula Frenchii now is the current nomenclature for that. Another neat community type we have in Southern Illinois, the acid gravel seeps. So acidic on the pH scale. This is uh, Cretaceous Hills in the example. And there are a number of nice seep springs uh, in this area and they harbor you know, different plants and some very rare. So examples we have for that community type, we have the Carex Atlantica called Star Sedge. It's really a neat little sedge there. Um, and it, if you look at the perigeny on the back of my hand, you can see that they're kind of triangular. They have a really wide base. Um, to the perigeny, and that makes them fairly distinct to identify. Also in the seep springs, you can find Platanthera clavellata, the club spur orchid. And it's kind of one of the easier Platantheras to identify because it usually just has a single leaf, one big leaf at the main, uh, the, the base of the plant, um, where the other Platantheras really have multiple leaves up the stem. So that's a cute little orchid that's quite rare statewide. And then Rexia mariana is the meadow beauty, and it is aptly named, definitely a beauty, and it is rare and often associates in or near these seep springs as well. Now moving on here to streams. Uh, there's not a lot of plants that grow in the stream itself, uh, but I wanted to include this because Plantago cordata is like super cool plant, heart leaf plantain, it grows in these streams, it likes, you know, cool, um, constant flow of water. And there's not a lot of high quality streams really in Southern Illinois. And there's, I think about 10 locations where this is still extant. And it's kind of neat, you know, the common plantain and English plantain and even others are, they're weeds. They're European weeds that are in our lawn, that are in parking lots and in, in, in fields and things. Uh, but here is a rare native plantago the heart leaf plantain. We can see a picture of the inflorescence there. It looks just like uh, the English plantain, Plantago lanceolata, but of course this is our native variety. And then not in the stream, but near streams, you can find the very rare Trillium viridi, which you call green Trillium. Viridi, viridi is Latin for green. And you can see the beautiful green petals and sepals on the green Trillium there. So. Like I said, this grows along streams up on the terrace or sometimes close to the water, but not in the water, like the Plantago. In a floodplain forest and swamp or neat communities, you know, particularly swamps in the southernmost part of the state is, uh, you know, an extension basically of Louisiana. They're connected to the Gulf of Mexico and up the Mississippi River and things. So whole new slew of plants in this habitat type like Hydrolia uniflora, the one flowered Hydrolia really a beautiful blue wildflower on that one. And then the Platanthera flava variety flava is the trooper gold orchid. So another Platanthera, you can see it's much leafier than the, the club spur orchid and it has yellow flowers. It's kind of a dainty plant. In fact, interesting story, this exact picture, I was going to see this species at a different site and it was about an hour from home and I was about halfway there and I thought, oh, there's this site I haven't been to in a while. I'm going to stop and check it out. And while I was there, I found a new population of the Platanthera flava variety flava. And uh, so I didn't actually need to go on to the next site to get my photo, which is why I wanted to go there. I'd never seen it before. And I was actually at this site on Sunday and found the plants. They're not quite flowering yet. So I'll be returning later with a volunteer to monitor that population. And then, of course, the wonderful Oxalis illinoisensis a species that was discovered and described in Illinois by John Schwegman. John has two species new to science that he has discovered and described in his lifetime. And that is pretty much the cream of the crop as a botanist. You're finding something new to science never been uh, described before. So that is exciting. We have that in Illinois, the Illinois wood soil. Other floodplain forest species that are rare and on the monitoring list, we have silver bells, Halesia tetraptera, beautiful plant. Seeing this, you know, being landscaped more and more uh, or used in landscaping, and it is really a beautiful wildflower and a tree, you know, small tree shrub. Uh, Styrax americana, I'm looking at all the locations for this shrub this year. It's 
there are a pretty good number of locations, but a number of them that I've been to, they have very sad looking vegetative plants that are small. So there's not a lot of mature shrubs, um, but I did find a few in, in full glorious bloom and they are just really beautiful. And, they, and you're in standing water when you see this plant. So that's a remarkable one. Then we have the stunning Clematis crispa or blue jasmine, very rare, just three or four locations for this wildflower um, with the beautiful purple flower. And then Amorpha nitens is the shining false indigo bush. I actually just took this picture on Thursday. I'd never seen this plant flower before. Very similar to Amorpha fruticosa. Um, there's a little, the difference to me is best seen it in the fruit. Um, just looking at flowers, it's really hard to tell apart. But this is a species in the southernmost part of Illinois. Now, upland forests, the last habitat I'm going to include here, we have, you know, this is, I should just put woodland. This is basically forested or canopy uh, areas. So we have the Stellaria pubera, the great chickweed, just a couple locations for that. Um, perennial chickweed in, in southern Illinois. We have the Actea rubifolia, which is black cohosh, or more appropriately, the Appalachian bugbane. Um, there's a a handful of locations for that. It's a pretty big plant, really tall inflorescence. My photo there, totally subpar. I'm going to have to find this one. It blooms later in the year, like in August. Um, so I'll have to get a better photo there later. And then Silenio beta, it's also very rare. It's, I think maybe just Hardin County, if I remember correctly. Um, perhaps Pope, I don't think so, but uh, ovate leaf catch fly is Silene oveda. Also a terrible photo. I need to get an updated picture for that one uh, this year sometime as well. And then the stunning wild azalea. And I went to all the wild azalea locations that I could find, um, read about or find this year. Um, and there's not that many, uh, there's a number of populations, but there's not necessarily a lot of shrubs at each one. But they, when they're in full bloom, I mean, it smells like bubble gum. It's like candy. It's really sweet, strong, pleasant smell on the rhododendron panophyllum in our upland forest. So this is not a state listed species, but I think it could be considered possibly to be one, but it is tracked by the Shawnee National Forest and uh, therefore monitored. But, you know, shrubs and woodies, probably don't need to be annually monitored unless visiting to look at um, reproduction and, and the flowering because a lot of the shrubs are vegetative. So I think it could be worthwhile to visit them for a short term at least and see um, how the flowering changes over time. So some of the results of the program here, the, the Northeastern Illinois area has been underway for 20 years or so. So they have a lot to boast about. 950 volunteers have been trained since 2001, 280 species monitored and 400 sites or more visited. So that represents a lot of data, a lot of excellent work by biologists and volunteers. Now in Southern Illinois, we've been underway since uh, July, uh, January 19th was my first day. Um, and obviously there was not a whole lot to do in January and need to get things going. But to this point, uh, we have 24 volunteers that are in the database and a, at least half of them I've already engaged and taken out in the field and have given assignments. So I'll continue to do that this year. So far, we have 35 species that have been monitored in Southern Illinois and 63 sites that have been visited. Now, I like to think of things as an EO. An EO is an element of occurrence record. So one plant at one site, even if there's multiple subpopulations, that would represent one EO. One plant at one site, all the populations at that site. So if you take that into account, so far this year, um, we have completed 98 EOs. So that seems pretty good so far for that. So now I wanna end here. Um, just mentioning some of the success stories that we've kind of had already in just the five months or so the program has been in Southern Illinois. Uh, the first uh, one that was really neat was Esplenium resilience. I had never seen this fern before, actually, or so I thought, 
because one of the sites we visited, I went in to look at my photos from 10 years ago, and I found a picture of a fern that I apparently never figured out when I was there. So that was kind of an interesting circle. But um, I wasn't familiar, obviously, closely with the species. And from what we learned, it seemed like this fern might have been on the edge of extinction or extirpation, I should say, in Illinois, that very little information had been collected in the last 20 years or so. And whatever was known was just a few individuals at, at one place, essentially. So Nick Seaton and I uh, mined the literature, and we found that there were five locations in three counties where this fern had been recorded in the past. And we visited, visited them all, and we found quite a few plants, um, several hundred actually at one site. Um, and so we were able to document them as extant in four of the five populations in all three counties of which they were previously recorded. One of the sites, um, it was only vaguely known where, and so I haven't given up on that yet, and I hope to return with some more information to find the fifth and final population for this fern. So we didn't know much about it, and now it turns out that it's, it's extant in most of the places where it was known, and um, many of them have you know, a, a good number of individuals there. Then I'd also never seen my Cranthes virginiensis mentioned earlier, the early saxifrage. I've never seen it flower before. And so that was one I really wanted to get out and see. And this plant only grows in Hardin County and only in Hardin County, really close to the Ohio River. It's very uh, restricted in its distribution in Illinois. Um, but where we looked at an appropriate habitat, these sandstone canyons were loaded with it. I mean, you couldn't count them. There were so many. I estimated um, in about eight polygons that we looked at 30,000 or more flowering plants. And we actually found a number of locations where it wasn't recorded, where there was tons of it. In fact, we talked to the landowner. Uh, we were on private land and the landowners, you know, we described the habitat and he said, oh, where the, where the cedars grow and the rock is out. We're like, yeah, yeah, do you have more of that? And he pointed us to, um, part of his property that was grazed to the bone and it was full of invasive species. But in between all that was tons of micranthes blooming all over the cliff. So that was really exciting to find a new, new spot for that. And that plant seems to be doing well. Also Carex nigro marginata, there weren't many locations for that species. And uh, Nick and I discovered two new locations, uh, one in Alexander County, one in Pope County for this plant. And, you can see here it's a sedge, so sedges can be hard to identify. And this one flowers in April, so pretty much when it's done, when it's done flowering, the perigenia fall off, and it's hard to confirm its identity. Uh, so you have to really go at the right time of year, and they're fairly easy, I think, to point out or notice, even if they're no perigenia. They look like they're stepped on. They look like they're hollowed out from the center, which you can see there in the photo, and they have really green leaves. I mean, it's a green green on them. And compared to some of the similar um, sedges that also have hairy perigenia, um, the leaves are quite wide, you know, compared to like Carex umbelata, Carex albicans. Um, so Carex nigra marginata, it's the black edged sedge. And you can see that here, the photo of the perigenia with the, the black edges on the scales. That was a neat find on those. And then another really awesome uh, thing that happened was Trillium viridi. It seemed like there was only two extant populations in Southern Illinois. One was very small. One was on private land and it had 100, almost 200 individuals. And so we decided to go downstream from that same location to another piece of private property. And uh, actually Robert Rothrock had been there probably 20 years ago or more. And he said, I, I think I saw green trillium there. So we got a hold of the landowner. We went and looked. We found almost 300 green trilliums, most of them blooming. So that was amazing. So then I looked at the map and noticed that there was another side creek that um, flowed into the creek where we found these two populations of trillium. And that was actually some public ground. And so I went there with a monitor and we found another 300 species uh, individuals of green trillium there so 
you know, we doubled the number of known locations for this, uh, this uh, species in Southern Illinois just this year. And actually um, the uh, Steve Tillman, the district heritage biologist for some of these counties, he found a new population um, last year and confirmed it this year as well. So, you know, this thing just, this plant seemed really rare. And now we have at least um, five uh, populations in the area. And then I want to mention Sinandra hispidula. This is called Guyandot beauty, or I, I call it hairy Sinandra. Uh, but this one um, is a biennial and it's only known in Jackson County. And I've been to four of the eight polygons, but this year I had some volunteers help and they like to do long distance hiking. And they went to some places where I told them to be on the lookout and they found Sinandra at a number of places. And then most excitingly, they went into um, a site in Union County and saw it there. And it had not been documented in Union County. So I went there to look. And as you can see in the photo, there was a, lots of it. I counted 800 flowering individuals at this site that somehow escaped detection because it was not known previously from Union County. So a county record of a state endangered plant, you know, that's about as good as it gets really. Um, and it's really a, a nice experience to find those. And then lastly, the trifolium reflexum is the rare buffalo clover. And this um, actually at this one site that has been burned um, this last year and, and somewhat regularly in the past, it really was thriving this year. So I went out there um, with the NOICE teachers. The NOICE program is a National Science Foundation funded program to uh, help train teachers with um, in the, the STEM topics. And so we went out and you know we paced off with about 20 volunteers and walked across the site with pin flags and flagged all the flowering plants we saw. And at the end of the day, we had 286 flowering clumps. So that is really remarkable. And that was really fun to, to not only have that experience and to find the plants, but to get all those volunteers engaged and in the field. So this is the staff at the Chicago Botanic Garden uh, that is involved with the Plants of Concern program. And of course, Gretel is the program manager and Katie and Natalie, the research assistants, and then many others behind the scenes. And then we have staff, uh, SIU, uh, Dr. Gibson, of course, the director, I'm a coordinator, Nick is helping out, and then we have a, some field assistants for the summertime. So nice little crew here, people um, getting out in the field to look for rare plants. So that is a little bit about the Plants of Concern program, particularly uh, in Southern Illinois. It's connecting people and plants to support happy, healthy humans and habitats. 